I want you to remember that God, God's created everything you see. He breathed it into existence. You remember when his people were caught up in slavery? He rescued them. What he did was he parted the sea and he made a way for them and then he delivered their enemies to them and he unlocks wounds and he provides water from a rock and he provides manna from heaven and he brought down the walls of Jericho. He froze the sun allowing victory. He's toppled giants with tiny stones. He's brought fire from heaven. He shut the mouths of lions. He preserved life in the belly of a well. He's fed thousands with a few loaves. He gives the weak strength. He heals the sick. He's made the blind see, the deaf ear, the mute speak, the lame walk, and he's overcome evil, and he's made a way through death for you and me by the death and the resurrection of his son, Jesus Christ, that we will live with him forever. We will dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever and ever and ever. What are we afraid of? His resume is flawless. He controls everything and he loves you.
I will not fear the storm. My help is on the way. My help is on the way. And oh my God, He will not delay. My refuge and strength always. How
Hello, Moon Valley. This is the uh, first time that we're gathering exclusively online for our Sunday services because of the COVID-19 pandemic. And we will continue in this mode until the public health authorities give us the all clear. I am uh, so grateful that you have joined us. I'm so grateful that we have the resources to to pull this off. And uh, I'm hopeful that God may use this different way of doing things to bring life to uh, more and more people. In some ways, uh, having everything online lends itself to uh, more sharing of content, whether it's uh, the music or the helps for kids or the sermon. You can immediately share it with someone else who might find it helpful, and I, I encourage you to do that. Going online is not just a precaution, it's an opportunity. These are uh, certainly anxious, unprecedented uh, times. On Monday morning, I, uh, I tried to go to Costco uh, mostly to get their Kirkland brand dog food because uh, that's what my dog Opie eats. As I drove up, I saw the, the parking lot was full. It's like 15 minutes before it opened and uh, there was a line waiting to get in, and the line went all the way around uh, the entire building. And so uh, I went to Fry's in, instead, and it was not quite as busy, and I was able to get most of what I needed, except the, the Kirkland dog food, of course. And that is, after I recovered from the incident with the lady in frozen foods. You see, I was going to pick up some frozen vegetables, and uh, thought I got lucky. Uh, a fries guy was just restocking the frozen vegetables as I arrived, but as I headed in, uh, a lady maneuvered me out of the way with her shopping cart, like NASCAR style. Uh, apparently, I got between her and the bird's eye steam fresh uh, mixed vegetables, and so she just took me out. <laughs> it is crazy out there. It is stressful. It's just so much to worry about. Uh, will I get infected? And even if I don't, will I survive this financially? What, what will I do with the kids um, and, uh, who are now home? How, how do I care for my um, parents? How long will all this last? COVID-19 has uh, drawn the curtain to reveal something that has actually been true all along. It's just not always in full view. We think we're more in control of things than we really are. Uh, life is fragile and fleeting. Uh, things can change in an instant, forever, and there are some things from which we cannot be saved by our government or our families or our friends or our doctors. Times like these invite us to think more deeply than we normally do about the most important things in life. Things like, where is my refuge? Where is my strength? Where can I find inner peace in the midst of this uncertainty. And if I am not in control, who is? Or is all this just random? Our thoughts turn to God, and like children who have uh, wandered home and find themselves in danger and afraid, a part of us wants to just run back home. A part of us wants to call out to our Heavenly Father for help. But there may be a catch. There may be a hidden problem that you think applies to you in particular. You may wonder if perhaps you've burned your bridges with God. You may worry that, that maybe you've screwed things up so badly in life that God really doesn't want to help you in a time like this. You may be concerned that 
that you have neglected or even denied God to such an extent that um, it would be insulting and self-serving to turn to God now when you need him. It may feel like a, a kind of double whammy. The pandemic and all its collateral effects strikes fear, um, and so does the thought of running to a heavenly father who may not accept you, who may not want you. It would be like asking for help from the relative from whom you have been estranged. You, you may get the cold shoulder or worse. Good news. Really good news. There's hope for you and me. We're going to get some help for this quandary from Scripture. And today we're continuing our sermon series titled, Now I See. It's a study through the Gospel of John. And the biblical text we're studying today is John chapter 18, verses 15 through 27. In this text, we're going to zoom in on two very different people who are cut from the same cloth as you and I. They are people who are in fearful circumstances, and they are people who stumble badly. They do reprehensible things, things that you might think are disqualifying in God's eyes. And we're going to see how God, in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, deals with these two people, people like us. But you're going to have to be patient. Uh, the payoff comes at the end of the, the sermon. Before we dive into the text, let me just set the stage. It is perhaps three or four um, o'clock in the morning on the day of Christ's crucifixion. Jesus has just been arrested uh, by a mob of hundreds of Roman soldiers and temple police who had been tipped off to his whereabouts by Judas Iscariot, one of the disciples. Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane, just outside of Jerusalem, with his other 11 disciples when he was arrested. And Jesus, um, under arrest, is now on his way to Jerusalem to be interrogated, first by Annas, uh, a recently retired Jewish high priest, and then by his son-in-law, Caiaphas, uh, who is the current high priest. Our text uh, begins in the first part of John 18:15 which says, Simon Peter followed Jesus, and so did another disciple. Two disciples are mentioned here. The first is Simon Peter. He is one of the two people that I want to feature in this message. Now, that Peter is mentioned first here is fitting. Peter um, had risen to preeminence among the disciples during Jesus' ministry. In the biblical lists of the 12 apostles, Peter always appears first. In fact, sometimes the gospel accounts say Peter and those who were with him to describe the, the 12. He is clearly the leader Peter was part of the inner circle along with James and John, all professional fishermen who spent more time with Jesus than any of the other disciples. And as part of this inner circle, Peter was called to be with Jesus and to serve him in ways others were not. Examples include the, the raising of Jairus' daughter and the, the transfiguration. Throughout the gospel accounts, Peter often acts and speaks on behalf of the others. He initiates, he asks the questions that they all want to know. Just the day before, Jesus had asked Peter and John to prepare the last Passover meal. And that night, just before the meal, it was Peter who questioned the, the washing of the disciples' feet by Jesus and then after the meal, when Jesus said he is leaving to a place that they could not follow, it was Peter who said, Lord, where are you going? I will lay down my life for you. That night, when the disciples went to the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus asked three disciples to be 
closer to him and to stay awake while he prayed. James, John, and of course, Peter. And when they fell asleep, Jesus first questioned only one disciple about it, Peter, because he's the leader. And when the mob came to arrest Jesus at the garden, it was Peter who boldly drew the sword and cut off the ear of Malchus, the high priest's servant. To be sure, Peter had held a very special place of prominence among the twelve. Peter was Jesus' main man. The second disciple mentioned in verse 15 is not named, and he's actually not one of the two people I want to feature But it's good to know a little something about him. Uh, We don't know for sure who this is, but many scholars believe it is the Apostle John, the author of our text, and I agree. This would be consistent with John's reluctance to mention his own name in the, the gospel that he wrote, and it would make sense that the other disciple would be part of the inner circle, as John is, and those closest to Jesus would want to stay close to him, even as he is tied up and being escorted away. If John is indeed the unnamed uh, disciple, that means our text is written by a direct eyewitness of the things recorded. And John says in the last part of verse 15 and the first part of verse 16, since that disciple was known to the high priest, he entered with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. But Peter stood outside the door. Now, this raises raises the question, how would John be known to the high priest? Well, we know that John's father, Zebedee, owns a fishing business that was prosperous enough to have hired hands. And so, John comes from a family of some wealth. And we also know that, that John's mother, Salome, Um, is interested in political power. She is the one who had approached Jesus privately, asking that her two sons, James and John, be granted positions of power and honor in Christ's kingdom, one on his right and one on his left. It's not unreasonable to think that in part because of their their wealth, she already enjoys considerable social and political power and wants to preserve or perhaps expand that power in Christ's coming kingdom. Besides the wealth and political power, some have even argued that John has some family ties to the high priest, although that is uncertain. So, given the family's wealth and power, uh, coupled with a possible family tie to the priesthood, it is reasonable that John is known to the high priest and that he would have some associated privileges and and priestly access others would not enjoy, including uh, entering into the courtyard of the high priest. Peter, on the other hand, does not have such access, and so it says he stood outside at the door. In order to get him in, John needs to pull some strings. The rest of verse 16 says, So the other disciple who was known to the high priest went out and spoke to the servant girl who kept watch at the door and brought Peter in. Now, it's possible that both Annas, the retired high priest, and Caiaphas, the current high priest, live in different parts of the same palace, joined by a common courtyard into which John and now Peter have entered. Verse 17 continues. It says, The servant girl at the door said to Peter, You also are not one of this man's disciples, are you? The term also suggests that the servant girl already knows that John is a disciple of Jesus. Peter's response is recorded in the last part of verse 17. He said, I am not. This first denial is terse, and it is a surprising contrast to the boldness that we've seen from Peter previously. 
Now, maybe, maybe Peter simply wants to get into the courtyard without having to engage in conversation with this servant girl. Maybe he rationalizes that now is not the best time to make some kind of stand for Jesus. Better to blend in and try to see what's going on with Jesus. Or maybe he's simply afraid. Maybe he just wants to protect himself. The first part of verse 18 continues. Now the servants and officers had made a charcoal fire because it was cold and they were standing and warming themselves. This confirms that it is still the wee hours of the morning. It's still dark and Jerusalem can be quite chilly in the um, mornings in the spring. And John provides an interesting detail. It is a charcoal fire. Now, save that to your mental desktop. Charcoal fire. We're going to come back to that later. Last part of verse 18 says, Peter also was with them standing and warming himself. Now, the Apostle John is a master storyteller, weaving evocative details and symbolism that that sort of enhance the the meaning. And here Peter is described as standing with the servants and officers of the high priest. The last time that word standing was used to describe someone other than Peter was recorded just 13 verses earlier in John 18.5, where it describes Judas Iscariot standing with the mob who arrested Jesus. It says there, Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. And so, like Judas, Peter is now standing with Jesus' enemies. Couple this with his denial at Jesus at the door, and you get a, a moment of troubling suspense. What is going on with Peter At this point, it doesn't look good for Jesus' number one guy. The master storyteller now cuts away to a different scene that is concurrently unfolding inside the the palace. Uh, Jesus stands before the retired high priest Annas, who is trying to get Jesus to incriminate himself so that he can have him executed. Jesus is being set up. Jewish leadership Uh, views Jesus as a false prophet who entices people to fall away from God, an offense punishable by death. Verse 19 continues, the high priest then questioned Jesus about his disciples and his teaching. Jesus answered him, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in synagogues and in the temple where all Jews come together. I have said nothing in secret Why do you ask me? Ask those who have heard me what I said to them. They know what I said. Now, ironically, Annas tries to get Jesus to incriminate himself, but Jesus ends up indirectly incriminating Annas. (laughs) Jesus says he himself has taught openly, which is in contrast to the covert night proceedings like this one, which were generally regarded as shady or illegal. Jesus asks, why do you ask me? And invites the calling of witnesses, which points up the fact that the questioning of a prisoner without witnesses was considered improper. And in that day, it violated a recognized legal principle that a person's testimony regarding himself was deemed invalid. One of the officers of... Annas recognizes that Jesus has just laid bare the the, the shadiness of these proceedings. And this officer is the second person I want to feature besides Peter. Verse 22 says, When he, Jesus, had said these things, one of the officers standing by struck Jesus with his hand, saying, Is that how you answer the high priest? Now, I want you to ponder for a moment how reprehensible this officer 
is and how Jesus must have felt. The officer shamefully slaps the Son of God in the face. By by the way, striking a prisoner was against the Jewish law. And then the officer scolds and demeans Jesus for being disrespectful to the high priest, which the officer probably views as a violation of uh, Exodus chapter 22, verse 28, which says, you shall not revile God nor curse a ruler of your people. The notion that Jesus is in the wrong here is is preposterous and maddening. Jesus is not the underling who is um, has cursed a ruler. Quite the contrary. Jesus is the one true God who is being reviled here. If I were Jesus, this story would not have ended well for this officer. Jesus could have vaporized this guy in an instant, and I would have. Or at least I would have given him the most painful case of kidney stones in history. Jesus certainly has the power to exact revenge in any way he chooses, but he doesn't. Jesus withholds the punishment the officer deserves. And listen to the measured, gracious reply of Jesus in verse 23. Jesus answered him, If what I said is wrong, bear witness about the wrong. But if what I said is right, why do you strike me? At this point, I imagine the officer is tongue-tied. And I imagine Annas realizes he's stuck. And um, Annas probably figures, hey, I'm retired. I don't need this kind of hassle anymore. Let the current high priest deal with Jesus. And so, verse 24 says, Annas then sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now, the scene shifts back to Peter in the courtyard. Verse 25 says, Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. So they said to him, You also are not one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. This is Peter's second denial. John's use of the word denial is telling. It means to repudiate or to disown. It is to disclaim any association with a person. And there's no way to pretty this up. Peter is renouncing Jesus. And it gets worse. Verse 26 says, One of the servants of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, Did I not see you in the garden with him? Now, the personal threat to Peter comes into focus. Of all people, a relative of Malchus, whose ear Peter had just cut off earlier that morning, a relative who was also part of the the mob arresting Jesus, a relative who probably now has a, a little score to settle on behalf of Malchus. This relative says, hey, wait a minute. Did I not see you in the garden with him? Verse 27 brings our text to a sad end. It says, Peter again denied it. And at once, a rooster crowed. Now, this is very significant because just a few hours earlier, Peter had pledged his allegiance to Jesus, saying, I will lay down my life for you. But as recorded in John 13, 38, Jesus answered, Will you lay down your life for me? Truly, truly, I say to you, The rooster will not crow till you have denied me three times. It is uh, the wee hours of that chilly morning on the day of Jesus' crucifixion, and the sad prophecy of Jesus is fulfilled by a rooster. Other gospel accounts tell us that the moment the rooster crows, Peter remembers what Jesus had said, and he leaves and he weeps bitterly 
over his denials. And so, how in the world does this depressing story of the reprehensible officer and the reprobate disciple give us hope? Let me explain. The officer and Peter present us with two people at opposite ends of the spectrum of humanity. The officer is far from Jesus. Peter is near. The officer does not believe in Jesus. Peter does. Because of unbelief, the officer has not yet received eternal life through faith. Um, uh, But through faith, Peter already has. The officer is an enemy of Jesus. Peter is a spiritual brother of Jesus. But the officer and Peter have some things in common. They both have uh, done some things that would seem to be unforgivable. unforgivable. Both brought Jesus great pain and suffering. Both are infected. Both are infected by a sin virus that hurts people, and the hurt spreads. And both, end, uh, and both men, at, at opposite ends, define for us a middle ground where we all find ourselves. It's hard to imagine anyone further from Jesus than the officer. And it's hard to imagine anyone closer to Jesus than Peter had been. And we all find ourselves somewhere between an officer and a fisherman, all of us infected by the same sin virus with varying symptoms. Even though Jesus knew in advance all the bad things that these two men um, had done and will ever do, even though Jesus knew how much they would hurt him, Jesus loves them both. And Jesus dies for them both. Neither is beyond the reach of God's grace. And the love of Jesus was determined to go to the cross for both of them, despite the officer's scornful slap, despite Peter's repeated denials. The invitation to come to Jesus is still open to them both. And if that is true for them, it is also true for us. And so, here's the the big idea. Here's the thing that I want you to remember. No virus can quarantine us from God's love. No virus can quarantine us from God's love. Not a sin virus, not a coronavirus. Have you burned your bridges with God? No. Have you screwed things up so badly in your life that God doesn't really want to help you in a time like this? No. Have you neglected or even denied God to such an extent that it would be insulting and self-serving to turn to God now when you need Him? No. Because no virus can quarantine us from God's love. Not a sin virus, not a coronavirus. And you may be thinking right about now, well, Bob, that sounds like a wonderful idea. But how in the world do you get that from this depressing biblical text? Well, the the charcoal fire. The charcoal fire proves it. You see, the original Greek word for charcoal fire appears in only two places in the entire Bible. One is in our text in John 18, 18, describing the fire in, in the courtyard. The other comes later, same gospel, John, uh, chapter 21, verse 9. And, and there's a connecting story behind the charcoal fire. You see, after his denials, Peter never gets to reconnect with Jesus before Jesus' crucifixion. Afterward, Peter returns to uh, the fishing business uh, that he was engaged in before, along with James and and John and 
uh, the, the, the two other members of the original inner circle and some of the other disciples join them because they too are fishermen. Just a matter of days after Christ's resurrection, they had fished all night and caught nothing, and they are returning to shore in the morning with empty nets, and perhaps there is still a chill in the air just as there had been on that night in the courtyard of the high priest. The resurrected Jesus uh, appears on shore and, and bids the disciples in the boat to cast their nets one more time for a miraculous catch. And then, and then Jesus calls them ashore. John 21, 9 says this, when they got out on land, they saw a charcoal fire, a charcoal fire in place with fish laid out on it and bread. Jesus serves them breakfast, a chilly morning, a charcoal fire, and Jesus nearby. What do you suppose Peter is thinking in this moment? It's not a stretch to believe the chill in the air, the smoldering glow of the charcoal fire brings back the painful memory of his denials. And, and Peter wonders if, if Jesus still wants them. He wonders if he has been disqualified. The, the breakfast, yes, is encouraging, but Jesus has not yet spoken to Peter individually the, the way that he did before all this. To Peter, it probably feels a little like a double whammy. The thought of distancing himself from Jesus strikes fear, and so does the prospect of approaching him only to find that maybe Jesus no longer accepts or wants him. After breakfast, according to John 21, Jesus addresses Peter directly, just like before. He asks Peter three times, do you love me? Peter says yes each time. But the third time, Peter is grieved because he recognizes the three repeated questions match his three repeated denials. But each time that Peter says, yes, I love you, Jesus responds by communicating his acceptance of Peter and, and that he still wants him. He, he does it by repeatedly saying, feed my sheep. Feed my sheep. This is Jesus' way of saying, be my guy again. Lead once more. Uh, get back in the saddle. You are not disqualified. I still love you. And I imagine the warmth of the charcoal fire never felt so good. The love and grace of the Lord Jesus Christ rekindles in Peter a passion that would end up changing the world. No virus can quarantine us from God's love. Not a sin virus, not a coronavirus. Let's pray. Lord God, in this scary time, help us to see the truth. The truth that no virus can quarantine us or separate us from your love. Your grace has overcome and our hearts are overwhelmed with gratitude. We turn to you, Lord Jesus. Amen.